Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. We, uh, we were talking about uh, lessons from Muslim history in the light of reward and punishment or reward and punishment in the light of lessons from Muslim history. And uh, this was the introduction that I gave in the previous session. So I will start with that. Before we can understand the rise and fall of Muslim empires and dynasties, we have to understand the spirit of Islam. Unflinching faith in Allah Ta'ala or uh, perfect Iman, that's the spiritual aspect. Adherence to prophetic qualities, that's something that we can see, that's the temporal aspect. And uh, the combination of the two uh, gives us Khalifatul Art, representative of Allah in terms of spiritual aspect and temporal aspect. Muslims are the representatives of Allah on earth. And the goal of, the, of being representative of Allah is to strive to connect the creation with the creator. Try to save people from the fire of Jahannam. It is not just uh, Kalima, Namaz, Roza, Hajj, Zakat. These pillars of Islam, these were practiced by the Ummah of all the previous prophets. We also practice them. But our specialty, we have been termed as the best of nations, not because of the five pillars, but because we will call people towards Allah, towards the good, Tamaruna bil maruf, call people towards the good, but tanhauna anil mulkar, and stop them from evil doing. But tukminuna billah, and bring iman in Allah. In other words, to strive to connect the creation with the creator, to try to save people from the fire of Jahannam. That's the goal. Not building empires for the sake of building empires, not building palaces, not uh, not uh, uh, showing tyranny, not subjugating, not oppressing, but showing the best of prophetic qualities. And through that, win the hearts of people and rule over their hearts rather than territories. And the goal is the sublime grand qualities of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi to imbibe those qualities in us rather than to build grand empires with grand palaces. So uh, we all know about many of the prophetic qualities. Just to refresh our memory about some of the prophetic qualities that I started narrating some stories in the previous session. And the stories are particularly relevant to forgiveness, forbearance, magnanimity, clemency. In other words, they center around equality of Allah, which is Hilm, and equality of all the prophets, which is Hilm. They were they are all they are all Halim, they were all Halims, and Allah is Halim. And Halim is a word in Arabic which is difficult to translate, but it comprises of forgiveness and forbearance and magnanimity and clemency and so on and so forth. So I started uh, uh, reminding you about some stories from the life of Rasulullah which centers around this particular quality called uh, Hill. And the reason I want to uh, firmly establish in our mind some of the prophetic qualities is so that we can better understand what happened later on uh, in, um, in Muslims and in Muslim empires, in Muslim dynasties, in relation to the prophetic qualities. Islam spread and Islam spread because 
of the profit equalities, not because of the sword. I, I talk about uh, this story of Rasulullah, the greatest danger of his life uh, when Aisha radiallahu anha asked her, and this was when he was bloodied by pelting of stones at Taif, and his whole body was was uh, filled with uh, with uh, blood. The blood got, uh, and his shoe got stuck. Blood went inside his shoes, and the shoe shoe got stuck uh, with his with his feet. He was so bloodied, and he's lost lost his consciousness. But he did not allow the angel of the mountains to uh, crush the people of Taif. Uh, and and uh, he wanted to be a mercy for them. And he said that if they do not accept Islam, at least their children will accept Islam later. And then we talked about the story of Dasur who came to kill Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, who will save you. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah, and the sword fell from his hand. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgave him. We talked about how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered his companions his companions uh, to treat the prisoners of Badr, entertain the prisoners with hospitabil hospitability, uh, entertain them hospitably. And after Ohud, when he was uh, uh, badly injured, he lost his consciousness and his helmet got stuck in his head, in his skull. And uh, there was blood coming out of his body and he gained consciousness and he said, Oh Lord, they know not what they are doing. Guide them to the straight path. And, uh, and during Hudaybiyah, the great uh, tolerance and forbearance he showed. And uh, when the, when the uh, companions wanted to uh, face the Quraysh because they imposed a highly uh, uh, unjust treaty on the Muslims and Rasulullah accepted the treaty and they wanted to fight the Quraysh. Uh, especially Omar Anhu said, allow us to, to fight them with our sword. Rasulullah said, I am the messenger of peace. The last one I read was, uh, I did not read in this order, that uh, I, I found this order to be better than the order I read them. After the Battle of Hunayn, when a poet slandered Rasulullah because he was not pleased with his share of the booties, he became Muslim recently. <laughs> and uh, Rasulullah said, cut, cut his tongue. There's a spelling error here, cut his tongue and uh, <clears throat> Ali radiallahu anhu took him before the cows and said, take whatever you want. And then the poet understood the meaning of cutting his tongue. And he, after that, whatever poem he wrote on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were all in the praise of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is how he won people. And this is one of the most, uh, 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 attractive qualities. And I will show you after I read, after, after I read the, uh, read these three stories, a pr prisoner guest, how he deals with the prisoner guest and um, what he does when he's insulted and bruised by a Bedouin. And after the conquest of Makkah, what he does and the effect of that on the Quraysh. That is something that he could not achieve even by showing them miracles, even by splitting the moon, he could not change their hearts and what he did through his forgiveness. So these three are left. There are so many stories of, on, on, on uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu being forgiving magnanimous, for, forbearing, and clement. So many stories. I just picked 
nine of them. Three are remaining <coughs> for today. <coughs> so Samama was a Sardar of Hunayfa clan, one of the bitterest enemies of Islam. He had killed a large number of converts to Islam. He had killed them. And at last he was taken prisoner and brought before Rasulullah And to make a long story short, he said to those around him, let each one of you treat Samama well. He had killed new Muslims. He was a voracious eater. He could eat a lot. Rasulullah went to his house and he said, today I have a guest who eats a lot. Get together all the food in the house. And they, they, they normally wouldn't be too much food in his house anyway. So they brought together all the food and Samama ate up everything. And the house of Rasulullah including him went without any food. Samama ate and drank and slept and observed all that was going around him. And whenever Samama would meet Rasulullah he would say, Muhammad, I have killed many of your men. If you want to take revenge, kill me. But if you want to want a ransom, I'm ready to pay as much as you want. He was a Sardar. Rasulullah would only listen. He wouldn't say anything. And actually, what Rasulullah wanted him, the Samama, to do was to observe the Muslims, their good manners, their treatment to him after he had killed many new Muslims, their hospita hospitality, and so on and so forth, so that his heart gets changed. He had killed Muslims, new Muslims. He was taken prisoner. And he could be easily killed by Rasulullah without breaching any international convention. But Rasulullah was not sent to send people to Jahannam. He was sent to attract people towards Allah so that they can go to Jannah. So he did not kill Samama. When he would talk about paying ransom, Rasulullah would keep quiet. Or you take revenge, you kill me. Rasulullah would keep quiet. After some days, Rasulullah let him go. And, and, and as I mentioned in a previous halakha, this was the way in which Muslim armies went and treated or behaved in front of the enemy armies. You, they, would, they would not go and start fighting right away. They would wait for a few days after giving Dawat. And they would wait for about three days or so, so that the enemy army could see them from a distance, what the Muslims do. so that they can be attracted. And if the enemy armies rejected the invitation, then there was fight. And actually there was a second condition. Okay, we will not fight, but give us the opportunity to give dawah to your people. We have not come to grab your land. Your land is yours. Give us the opportunity to give dawah to your people. If that was denied, so first you accept Islam, that was denied. Okay, give us the opportunity to give dawah to your to your people, that was denied, then there was war. And when there was war and the Muslims won, and in, in most cases, the Muslims were outnumbered, three to one, 10 to one, even 10 to one, and they got prisoners, they treated them with utmost respect and hospitality. There was no torture. 
the international war, war uh, how to treat the prisoners. This is all from the way the Muslims treated the, the uh, prisoners, especially during the time of Rasulullah and the Khulafai Rashidin. And when I also mentioned this earlier, when Rasulullah would send an army, he would tell them explicitly, do not kill women, children, and unarmed civilians. Do not destroy crops. Do not destroy fruit bearing trees. This is how we send armies. Because the goal was to win them over. The goal was not to send them to hellfire. The goal was to win them over so that they can also know the beautiful qualities of Rasulullah which came from the beautiful qualities of Allah Ta'ala so that they can also be a part of Jannah rather than a part of Jahannam. That comes from, from prophetic qualities. We can only attract people through qualities. When they like us, they want to be like us. We are so far away from the prophetic qualities. And I'm talking about just one of them, forgiveness. So Samama was, was let free. Samama left for his home. After going some distance, Samama halted under a tree. There he stood and stood and thought whatever transpired in the previous number of days. Then he sat down on the sands and kept thinking still. After a short time, Samama got up, took his bath, performed his ablution, and started back for the Prophet Sallallahu home. On going back to the Prophet, Samama embraced Islam. And now he becomes Razi Allahu Anhu. He's a companion. A person who could be sent to hell by killing him is a part of paradise, Allah's mercy. Samama Razi Allahu Anhu spent some days in the company of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi to learn Islam and then left for Makkah to see the Holy Kaaba. At Kaaba, he loudly proclaimed, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Makkah was still in the hands of the Quraysh. They flocked in and swarmed around Samama. Swords flashed over his head. Someone among the crowd said, don't kill him, don't kill him. He is an inhabitant of Imama. And without the food supply from Imama, we cannot live. Samama Razi Allahu Anhu said, but that alone is not sufficient. You have persecuted, you have persecuted Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam much. Go at once to him, beg his pardon and make compromise. Otherwise I will not allow a grain of wheat to come to Makkah from Imama. The effect of forgiveness. It has such far reaching effect. The, Makkan, the Makkans appealed to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you enjoin kindly treatment towards kinsmen and neighbors. We are your kinsmen. Now they are his, his kinsmen. Will you starve us to death in this way? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at once wrote to Samama requesting him to lift the ban on export to Makkah. Samama Razi Allah who readily complied. The Makkans were saved from starvation. And after eating to their fill, they began to prepare for another expedition against Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is Makkans. And that is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next one I want to talk about is about Rasulullah's treatment to a Bedouin. Now, there are many, many stories like this. Uh, some are longer. I've picked a short one. 
and see how he is treated, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and how he treats the Bedouin. Once a Bedouin came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and seizing hold of his wrap, tugged it so hard, and there was a piece of cloth around his uh, around his uh, shoulders, and uh, uh, the Bedouin caught hold of that of the tunic and tugged it so hard that his neck was bruised. And he said, I mean, he could have said that plainly, give me some food. He got hold of his tunic, tugged it hard. He was bruised and he was suffocating. And the Bedouin said to the person who is suffocating, have corn loaded on these camels of mine. If you do this, you will not be parting with your own riches or those of your fathers, meaning that everything available in the Baitul Mal belongs to the public and not to you. And he's talking in the most insulting manner. Rasulullah replied, I will give you nothing unless you compensate me for tugging at my wrap. The man said he would give no compensation. He would not apologize. Still, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled, smiled. And this is not just one story, as I told you. And ordered corn to be loaded on the Bedouin's camels. The last one, conquest of Makkah. I will read from a beautiful writing, beautiful writing, not too long, no. Uh, not too long, but also, you know, it's, it's not uh, short also. I'll read from a beautiful story. It's written in such a beautiful manner that I'm tempted to read line by line. I will, I will add here and there. In the early stages of the ministry of Rasulullah, the inhabitants of Makkah, with a few notable exceptions, persecuted him with relentless rancor, enmity. Not content with mere oppression, oppression, the Meccans at last hungered for his life and he had to repair to Medina to save his neck. After years of intense suffering, Rasulullah succeeded in winning the years of a considerable body of his countrymen. They accepted his message and gathered un under the flag to defend him and to defend their new faith from the attacks of the pitiless enemies but the Meccans were still tireless in their hostility. In violation of the terms of the Treaty of Udaibiya, they attacked the clan of Bani Khuza that was under the protection of the Muslims and massacred a number of them. The Bani Khuza appealed to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for justice. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at once marched 10,000 warriors against the violators of peace and entered Makkah practically unopposed. So you can see he had forgiveness, but when, it, when the time came, he could take action. So he went to conquer Makkah to uh, honor the treaty with Bani Khuza. And he did not know what would happen. He went with 10,000 soldiers and he didn't know if he, if he, there would, would be a fight, in which case he would have to kill some of the Makkans in the fight. So he first sent 5,000 of them. The first one, Khalid bin Walid, Allah, who with 1,000 in this way, there were uh, about seven or eight uh, detachments under different uh, uh, Amirs. And the last detachment of 5,000 was headed by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all the detachments, the first 5,000 in few different groups, seven or eight, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of them entered Makkah without any opposition, without any opposition. In other words, except for one detachment which was coming through a different route 
and they were attacked and they had to kill one or two Makkans. Except for that, there was no bloodshed. And the everybody knows about the conquest of Makkah and that, that it was, it was uh, virtually bloodless. And then everybody knows that he forgave. But, but one aspect he didn't know, or that most people do not know, is that when Rasulullah entered Makkah, he did not enter Makkah on a strong, sturdy horse. He did not, he did not want pride to enter him. He did not want to enter as a conqueror, though he is entering as a conqueror. He rode a mule. And it is recorded that when he entered Makkah, or as he was entering Makkah, his head was bent so much so that he, he, his head or his nose as if touched the back of the mule. And he was seeking forgiveness from Allah. And he was praising Allah Ta'ala. When he left Makkah eight years ago, and this was the eighth year of Hijrah, when he left Makkah, he cried. He left with Abu Bakr, anhu. he cried. And he said, oh Makkah, I love you. I love you so much. If it were not for my people, I would not leave you for anything. And at that time, Allah Ta'ala revealed a verse in which he said, Allah said, or he promised that I will bring you back to Makkah. Oh, Nabi, I will bring you back to Makkah. That's the gist of the verse. And Allah Ta'ala is fulfilling his promise. And he thanked Allah Ta'ala for bringing him back to Makkah. And he's seeking forgiveness. And it is not mentioned why he's seeking forgiveness. This is just my conjecture that he's seeking forgiveness so that pride does not enter his heart. Shaitan does not creep in and infuse pride in him. That the people who tortured him for 21 years by that time, not only in Makkah, and tortured his companions and killed his uncle in the battle of Ohud and killed his daughter when he was leaving uh, Makkah for Medina after Rasulullah migrated. Zainab radiallahu anha. And somebody threw a spear and it hit his private parts. And from the wound, she died after some time. And so many of his companions were persecuted or killed or orphaned or widowed in the previous 22 years. Untold suffering. No prophet was made to suffer as much by their people, uh, by, by their people as Rasulullah Sallallahu was made to suffer. And now he is entering as a conqueror on a mule with head bent down in thankfulness to Allah Ta'ala and seeking forgiveness. He's the victor at last. Those who had scoffed at him as a dreamer spat him on his face, threw thorns on his way and deposited the entrails of camels over his devoted head while bent down, while he was bent down in obedience to Almighty Allah were there before him. These people were there before him, now vanquished and broken. Those who had interned him, that means uh, there was a time when the, over three year period, the Muslims were kept in a gorge outside Makkah for three long years with whatever food they could, which lasted for a few days, some days, and then food was over. And nobody could transact with them, trade with them, 
nor could they trade with anybody. They were confined to a natural uh, prison. No house, I don't know how they lived. No food. Three years in the scorching sun. This part of the story of Islam is forgotten. Three years blockaded. And after three years, something happened and then the Quraysh forgave them. So in turn, interned him and his companions and tried to starve him to death. Those who had surrounded his house in the darkness of night on the, this was the night of, uh, of Hijra, of uh, going from Makkah to Medina with murderous resolve. And there were 11 of them who surrounded his house with sword and ready to kill all of them all at once so that uh, none of the 11 tribes could be blamed uh, uh, alone. And those who had exiled him from his dear native land, they were all there and at his entire mercy, those who had attracted him again and again, lacerated his forehead with stones, broke his teeth and killed his nearest kins and comrades before his eyes, they were there that day, weak and helpless. These, those who had ruthlessly hunted him, even in his exile, Battle of Badr, Battle of Ohud, in this way, there were 10 battles that were fought by the time Rasulullah Sallam came to Makkah, that was the 11th one. Those who had ruthlessly hunted him in his exile, those who had disgraced humanity by inflicting shameless outrages upon inoffensive men and women, and even upon the dead body of his companions, they too were there, humbled at his feet. But there was no sign of anger or hatred in the face of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who suffered for 22 years, untold suffering. On the contrary, his face blossomed up in mercy to men and gratitude to Allah. In the hour of triumph, every evil suffered was forgotten. Every injury inflicted was forgiven and a general amnesty, amnesty was proclaimed to the population of Makkah. The army emulated his example. Now, Abu Sufyan was there, you know, in the uh, outskirts of Makkah when the Muslims were entering. And, and one of the commanders uh, in the beginning, before Rasulullah entered, one of the commanders said, Oh Abu Sufyan, today there will be bloodshed. And Abu Sufyan started trembling with fear. And when Rasulullah entered with his 5,000 troops, Abu Sufyan said, Oh Muhammad, Ras oh, Ras Ya Rasulullah, now he's saying, Ya Rasulullah. Previously, they would say, O oh, Muhammad, will there be bloodshed? And Rasulullah said, there'll be mercy, no bloodshed. But your commander said there'll be bloodshed. And uh, I think it was Usman radiallahu anhu who told Rasulullah Ya Rasulullah, Saad, that was the, the name of the commander. Not Saad bin Abi Waqqas, but another commander. I forgot his last name. Uh, take the flag from Saad. Saad had the flag of the Muslims. The, pro, the uh, flag of the, of, of, of the Muslims. Take the flag because his sword is very sharp. He can start bloodshed anytime. And then the Quraysh will also start fighting. And there'll be bloodbath in Makkah. Take the, the flag from him. Now, taking the flag from a commander is insulting him in the battlefield. Rasulullah Sallam, see his wisdom, sent the son of Saad, go and take the fla uh, flag from your father. So the son went, I won't lengthen the story, and took the flag. And obviously, 
uh, initially the the father said, "Bring a sign from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he wants me to give you the flag." And uh, the son went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He gave his uh, yamama, that means his uh, his uh, his pagri pagri. Go and uh, show this to your father. And uh, the son showed that, and he he readily obliged and gave the flag to his son. And no, see, this is the wisdom that it is much less insulting for a person and uh, uh, painful for a person to give the flag to his son, own son. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there'll be no bloodshed to Abu Sufyan. And he announced, he, he told Muslims to announce Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, the implacable enemy of Islam, will be saved. Whoever uh, stays in their house will be saved. Whoever stays in the Kaaba will be saved. In other words, this is how he announced general amnesty. Do not fight, you'll be saved. Even in the house of Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan became, became uh, uh, very pleased, very pleased and later he accepted Islam. So then the army emulated his example. No house was entered into, no inhabitant molested, no woman insulted. Then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addressed the assemblage and declared in his own inimitable voice, all glory and all victory belongs to Allah. Now he was, when he was entering Makkah, he thanked Allah for the victory. He did not th 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 thank uh, the Muslims for the victory. The victory is from Allah. And here he's saying, all glory and all victory belongs to Allah and to Allah alone. No one has any superiority, any superiority over his neighbor except for his virtue. All are children of Adam, alayhi salam. The noblest of men is he who is foremost in his good deeds. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam paused for a moment and looked at his enemies still trembling in their heart. No one could say if any poison memory of the bygone days flashed across his mind at their sight. But he addressed them in a tranquil voice. Now this is what is called cleansing the heart. And there's a hadith in which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, shall I tell you of my exalted sunnah, O Anas? Do tell me, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, cleanse your heart morning and evening. This is my sunnah. One who loves my sunnah loves me. And one who loves me will live with me in paradise. And that is the reflection of his practicing on, his, on, on what he said. Then there was no sign on his face of any rancor, of any memory of the, of the bygone days, of the torturous bygone days. So he addressed them, descendants of the Quraysh, how do you expect I should treat you with kindness and pity, gracious brother and nephew, replied they. Tears filled the eyes of Rasulullah at these words. And he said, I shall speak to you as Yusuf spoke unto his brothers. Alayhi salam. And I, if you, I'm sure you know the story of Yusuf. Alayhi salam. He was thrown by his uh, nine brothers, stepbrothers in a well from where he was uh, uh, picked up by accidentally, they were looking for water, some travelers, they were taken to Egypt and he was sold and he was uh, bought by the, the um, Aziz of Egypt. And uh, then after uh, uh, the incident with the wife of the Aziz, he was sent to the prison. And then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Yusuf salam himself became a minister, minister of food. I, I mean, there's a long story. And uh, the, there was a famine and his brothers, the nine brothers came before him for food. He was the minister of food in Egypt. 
and his brothers came from uh, around Syria for food. He could recognize his brothers, but did not tell them. First time they came, he did not tell them that you threw, I'm your brother and you threw me and now you have come to me for a food. Second time they came, he did not tell them. Third time they came, third, uh, after the second time he had to tell them that you have a younger brother, bring him, his own brother, uh, Benjamin. So uh, when they came the third time, that is when Yusuf salam mentioned to his brothers, but in a most apologetic manner, you did uh, such and such thing. And I know you did this out of ignorance and not charging them in any manner in such a, in, 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 in such a lenient manner, in, as if he was apologizing for, for mentioning these words. Yusuf salam was apologizing. So uh, this is the reference uh, that we should have in mind uh, when, we, uh, when we hear this part. I shall speak to you as Yusuf spoke unto his brothers. I shall not reproach you today. I shall not even tell you anything in reproach. Not, not taking revenge, but I will not even reproach you. Uh, and uh, I, I heard from a scholar, he even said that you haven't done any wrong. So how do I even forgive you? You haven't done any wrong. How do I even forgive you? And But here it is mentioned, I shall not reproach you today. Allah will forgive. He is the most merciful and most compassionate. And let me finish just because time is over. Let me finish just in one sentence, the effect of this. You know, the effect of this is he showed them miracles after miracles written in Bukhari, Bukhari, his miracles compiled in uh, Bukhari Sharif. Number of miracles, many of them. If we have, uh, Sometime, someday, we will go over them, inshallah. And uh, I guess the one that we know about the most is splitting the moon. He even did that. By the order of Allah, moving his finger. And they, or very few of them became Muslims of the Quraysh. Innumerable miracles, very few of them became Muslims. And some of them, blazing miracles. And after forgiveness, and this is the power of forgiveness. This is why among all his qualities, I started speaking about forgiveness first and first of all. They became Muslims en masse. And Rasulullah forgave them. Not only forgave them, he forgave Hind. Hinda, who chewed the liver of his uncle after the battle of Ohud. He forgave the person who threw spear in the private part of Zainab radiallahu anha. He came to become Muslim. He forgave everybody. He forgave Abu Sufyan, the leader of, after Abu Jahl, he was the leader of the Quraysh, of the enemies. So what miracles could do, could not do, what miracles could not do, forgiveness did. We'll continue from that point, inshallah. Good. Um, uh, we are studying hadith number four of Imam Nabibi. So let me uh, recall the hadith first. Okay, so the hadith says like this. Verily, the creation of any one of you takes place when it is assembled in his mother's womb for 40 days as a drop of fluid, then become a clot for a similar period. After that, uh, thereafter, it is, it, it is a lump looking like it has been chewed for a similar period. And then the angel is sent to him. So the first part is Hadith is talking about how a human developed in the ovary of mother. So this is the first part of the uh, Hadith that says there is three stage. One is a drop. 
uh, which is uh, in Arabic called Nutfa, and then uh, Alaka, which is a clot, and then a flesh, morsel of flesh, which is Mudga. Okay, the second part of Hadith said that the <coughs> angel has been sent to him to breathe rue into him. So this angel is commanded yeah. to write four decrees. And these decrees are provision, lifespan, his deed, and whether he will be among the wretched or among the blessed. So this is the second part of the hadith. Second part of the hadith is talking about a qadr actually, a qadr of human being. Okay, so there is a third part of this hadith. And I swear by Allah, there is no God but he. One of you may perform the deeds of people of paradise till there is a knot but an arm's length between him and it, when what which has been written will be overstep him, so, so that he will perform the deed of a hellfire. And then again, someone and then again someone who is performing the deed of hellfire Still, there is a knot, but an arm's length between him and it, and then the Qadr will take over and he will be doing the, uh, he will perform the deeds of paradise and entire daddy. So, this is the third part of the Hadith. Third part of the Hadith is talking about that we may do a good job, but suddenly at the last end, everything can change. <laughs> So, third part of the hadith is talking about uh, how uh, a fate of a man is changed at the end of his life. So, this hadith consists of three parts. Okay, actually, uh, last time, last time, that is three weeks before, we we talk about few things already regarding these hadith. Okay, we we discuss about uh, we discuss we introduce the narrator. The narrator was Abdul Rahman Abdullah Ibn Masud. Uh, he's a very simple man, but he has a very high rank in Islam. So in, we introduce him on the last session, and then also we we talk about the knowledge. That is presented within in this hadith. This knowledge was not known to anybody, and this is a knowledge uh, during that time nobody knew about it. And this hadith is a proof. This hadith is a, a discard, discard the Hegorism. Hegorism is a theory that as, uh, that claimed that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, collected stories from Taurat and Injil and compiled in Quran. So this hadith actually discard this idea, disprove. Okay, we discussed uh, we uh, discussed this issue in the earlier se session, and the last thing we dis uh, discuss in the last session that when there's a conflict, when there's a conflict between Quran and Hadith, or uh, a, a divine message and signs, if there's a conflict, how to reconcile this conflict? So there are some point has been discussed. Well, there are some reasoning has been discussed that. Uh, why this thing can happen? Because our intellect came from Allah, our uh, divine knowledge also came from Allah. So theoretically, th there shouldn't be any difference. But if we come across the, if we come across any uh, conflict, this conflict can be reconciled through certain process. So this was discussed in the last class. So this is actually the first part of the hadith, uh, actually the introduction of the hadith. Now we are entering the formation of human being in the mother's womb. So let us remember that this hadith is talking about uh, formation of human being in mother's womb. It it excludes the formation. It excludes the creation of Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam, uh, the creation creating process of Adam alayhi salam is not discussed here. Okay. So the first thing the hadith say that. A uh, angel has been sent who blew ruh in human being. 
So let us ask what is Ru? What is Ru? So Ru is something uh, even now science cannot determine what is Ru. It is beyond the knowledge of science until now. So regarding Ru, uh, there is a information given in the Quran, Surah Isra. Surah Isra, Allah said that, Allah said to Muhammad that people will ask you about Ru. So, Ya uh, Tasaluna Ani Ru. People will ask you about Ru. Then Allah Ta'ala uh, Allah Ta'ala mentioned that Wama Uti Tu Bin Ilmi Illa Kalila. We give you very little knowledge about Ru. We give you very little knowledge about you. So, what we know about Ru is Ru is created very long time before. And all rules are created at the same time, and they were preserved in Lohe Mahfuz. So, if we, if we consider the age of the rule, age of the rule is all same. That means no. Uh, uh, in the life of uh, Lohe Mahfuz, there is a, no senior and no junior. Everybody of equal age. All right. So, also from here, we uh, Olema say there is something that that any human being have five lives. Any human being have five lives. So uh, the first life is uh, is a life of Ru, life of Ru. Then the second life is the life of the mother's home, life inside mother's home. So third life is a life of dunya. Fourth life is a life of Bajak. So life of Bajak is the time from we die until uh, uh, the last day, last day of judgment. So this is the yes. time of Bajak. And then fifth life is life of Akira. So we do not have to worry about uh, we die because actually we are going through five lives and there will be transformation. Okay. Also, from the hadith, we know that when we when we raised up from uh, from uh, cover in the day of judgment, our age will be all thirty three. No difference, you know. Everybody will be of equal age, thirty three. All right. So. Let's go to this is talk about Ru. After that, the uh, the angel will blew four decree. So this four decree, the first decree talking about lifespan. Life has is mentioned in Arabic as Azal. Azal. Azal no. there there are there are three components within the Azal. One is age, one is time, and place of death. There's three components. Okay, then we have provision that is risk. Risk has five components. These five components are knowledge, health, wealth, spouse, and children. So inside the provision, there will be five components. And then we have there will be written deeds, good deeds, and bad deeds. And additional information is given here that it will be decided who will be uh, who will be successful and who will be uh, wretched. That means uh, it is decided, it is written by the angel or determined by the angel that who will be who will go to heaven and who will go to uh, uh, hell. It is already all decided during that time. So this is talking about Qadr and we will talk about Qadr later on. I think uh, I will not be able to complete the discussion on Qadr, but we will touch it some part of it. Okay, so uh, yeah. So to understand Qadar, to understand Qadar, we have to go back to the some of the basic uh, understanding of Allah, Sifa of Allah. Okay, first thing we should know about to understand Qadar, the knowledge of Allah. What is the what is what is the nature of knowledge of Allah? So knowledge of Allah is all encompassing. Everything Allah knows beforehand. So it is said in the Hadith that. Is uh, Allah create pain first, and then Allah asks pain to order write everything, and the pain start writing starting from creation of pain until the uh, last day. So this is this is knowledge of Allah. This is knowledge of Allah, and this piece of information. Is actually by hadith we know it is written 50,000 years before starting of any creation. 
before starting of creation of heaven and hell. It is written 50,000 before, 50,000 years before. And this piece of information is preserved in uh, Lauhe Mahfuz. And other than Allah, no one has access to this knowledge. Okay, so what is this knowledge? Is it Qadr? This, this point we have to understand. Actually, this is not Qadr because the nature of the knowledge of Allah is such that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't compel someone to do something. But because of the, uh, because of the greatness of Allah, Allah knows everything. Allah knows everything doesn't mean that it, he, he is compelling to do anything. So the example is given by Ulema that when you enter a, enter a dark room, we cannot see anything. We cannot see anything. If we switch on the light, then we can see everything. But switching on the light doesn't change the state of the material, or doesn't change the state of objects inside the room. So Allah's knowledge is like a light. It helps you to see. So Allah see everything, but it doesn't uh, change the state of the thing. So this nature of Allah's knowledge we have to understand first, to understand Qadr. So whatever, uh, whatever Allah knows, it is Allah's knowledge, it is his greatness. But it doesn't mean that Allah is forcing you to do that. Because human being is created with a free will, freedom of will, and uh, and and also yeah freedom of will and human beings are responsible for choosing their will or choosing their action okay so next thing we have to understand about uh, irada irada when we wish allah's wish irada of allah so irada of allah in one word whatever allah wishes will happen whatever allah doesn't wish will not happen so to become successful to be, if we want to become successful in any, any action, our wish and the wish of Allah has to be in same line. If our wish and wish of Allah is different, means we will not be, be able to attain success in that matter. Okay, so irada of Allah has three grade, three stage. Irada of Allah has three stage. Alright, so uh, first stage is Whatever Allah wish that will happen, whatever Allah doesn't wish will not happen. This is, uh, this is purely Allah's wish. Nobody can change this. Okay. Second uh, thing of irada is called irada kaunia. Irada kaunia is when Allah creates something, he set up a rule. He set up a rule and all his creation follow the rule. So this this is called irada kaunia. Irada kaunia is set of rules that is created by Allah and all his creation follow this rule. And that really means that, that really talks about natural laws and law of causality. We know that the law of causality is, means that uh, every, every uh, some, uh, action got a reason behind. That means something is happening due to some reason behind it. So this is this law is called the law of causality. So law of causality and law of nature. This is what we talk about science. When you talk about science, it's all about law of causality and law of nature. And human being is not going to ask about law of causality and law of nature. But what our scientists do, they, they explore this law of causality and law of nature and from there they try to uh, take some advantages okay then let's talk about third stage of grade of irada third grade of irada is called irada masia irada masia is a, is a knowledge that is uh, that allah prefers his creation to irada masia is created for uh, only those creation who has freedom of choice not for other. So those creation who have freedom of choice, Allah provides some guidance for them. That Allah prefers that you follow this. Allah prefers that you do good deeds. Allah prefers that you do you worship Allah. But Allah doesn't force you to do this. So this is uh, third grade of 
uh, irada. So what we make mistake when you talk, we, when you think about Qadara, we usually get confused about the first stage, Allah, what Allah wish that will happen. And irada, masya, that Allah sets some guideline that Allah prefers his creation follow this. So usually we make confusion with these two uh, things. And that makes the, uh, makes the Qadar very uh, complicated to understand. So, actually, I, because of the short of time, I'm talking about very, uh, very uh, concisely. So, you can ask question later on, and I let me finish this Qadar part so that uh, next class we will finish the whole hadith. We will cover another item. So, let's talk about Qadar now in more detail. So, Allah set up a uh, set up a uh, right in writing in in writing. He set up a rec record in Lauhe Mahfuz. This is called Qadar Kulli. This Qadar Kulli is final. Nobody can change this. That means eh, we make dua, we make, uh, uh, we make jakat, we make donation, we uh, pray to Allah, we cry, and Allah three and four and five times, He uh, remove our trouble, He increase our lifespan, and finally what will happen is written in the Qadar Kulli. So Qadar Kulli is the final, which is written, uh, which is uh, made, kept in the Lauhe Mahfuz, and no angel, no jinn, no creation has access to it. Only Allah knows it. So we do not know it. Then second level of Qadar is uh, is called uh, Qadar. Uh, this hadith that Qadar created during the inside mother womb is the second grade of uh, Qadar. So, in second grade of Qadr, angel come and write the Qadr. So, other than Allah, angel also knows this Qadr. This Qadr is known to angel. This is not, uh, this is not totally gaib. This is not totally knowledge of gaib. This is, some people know. Then third grade of Qadr is, we call Qadr Sanawi. Qadr Sanawi means in every uh, year, uh, Laylatul Qadr. Allah Ta'ala write Qadar for every person for one year. So this is called Qadar Sanawi. This is also not fully guided. Some of the creation know about this Qadar. And third type of, uh, fourth type of Qadar, we say, uh, many ulema say that there's a daily Qadar written. That is between, uh, between prayer of Asar and uh, Maghrib. Prayer of Asar and Maghrib, the daily, uh, daily deeds are, uh, reach Allah and Allah write Qadar for next day. Or, uh, this is not Allah write, this is actually angel write, all angel write. So this is, so daily Qadar is regularly updated. When you do uh, good deeds, when you do good deeds, our reject increase, our lifespan increase, uh, our calamity remove. So this Qadar is written every day. So uh, according to the formula, according to the formula Allah given to angel, when you do some action, uh, angel update this Qadar. Okay. So similarly, uh, Qadar, uh, yearly, Qadar Sanawi, Qadar Sanawi is a yearly Qadar. Okay. Qadar Sanawi also updated every year. And uh, Qadar, uh, Qadar uh, uh, during the child birth, this is not, up, this is not updated, but this is also updated. This is, could be also updated. In certain cases, this could be also updated. But Qadar Kulli doesn't change. So when you talk about Qadar, we have to understand three, these four levels of Qadar. And which Qadar can change, we can easily understand from this uh, discussion. Okay, so I think the discussion is quite heavy for today. I think uh, I, will, I will leave it here. The last part of this hadith that why the action of a man suddenly changed before death. This third part of the hadith eh, we will discuss in the next uh, week. Uh, because it is related, let us absorb the, uh, this part of the hadith and since I speak very concisely, maybe many of you cannot understand my uh, words fully, so I actually posted one book in the group. You can see that a few days before I posted one book in the group uh, in PDF form, its uh, name is Shahar Arbain An-Nabibi. Uh, this is a 200 pages book, 
200 words by this book. You can go through this book also. Uh, this thing, are, uh, there's it's a more detail is written in the book. You can you can uh, you can go through if you are very interested, actually. So uh, let me stop here and I open the next time. May Allah Taala give us tawfiq. Allahumma amin, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, jazallahu anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ahu wa ahu, la ilaha illallah, alayhi wa sallam, subhanallahi rabbil ashil azim, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rabbana la tuakhizna in nasina wa akhtana rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama amaltahu ala alladhina min kablina rabbana wa la tuhamminna ma la tuakadalana bihi. ওয়ালা <laughs> তুমি আমাদেরকে যা কিছু আমল করার তুফিক দিয়েছো ব্যক্তিগত ভাবে যা কিছু সমষ্টিগত ভাবে আমল করার তুফিক দিয়েছো বলার তুফিক দিয়েছো শোনার তুফিক দিয়েছো এসবের মধ্যে ভুল ভ্রান্তি সংশোধন করে তোমার শাহী দরবারে কবুল করো আল্লাহ কবুল করো আল্লাহ কবুল করো আল্লাহ এবং তার সওয়াব রসুল করিম সাল্লামের কাছে পৌঁছে দিও আল্লাহ এবং তার সব আমাদের পিতা মাতা দাদা দাদি নানা নানি চাচা চাচি খালা খালু মামা মামি আত্মীয় স্বজন বন্ধু বান্ধব শিক্ষক শিক্ষত্রী পাড়া প্রতিবেশী তথা সমস্ত মুসলমানের কাছে পৌঁছে দিও আল্লাহ তাদের কবর রাজা মাফ করে দিও কবরকে প্রশস্ত করে দিও জন্মাতুল ফেরদোসের বাগান বানিয়ে দিও নূর দিয়ে পরিপূর্ণ করে দিও আল্লাহ তাদেরকে কেমতের দিন তোমার আরশের নিচে ছায়া দিও আমল নামার ডান হাতে দিও নিশ্চিন্ত মনে রেখো আল্লাহ বিদ্যুতের গতিতে পুলসিরাত পার করে দিও বিনা হিসাবে জন্মাতুল ফেরদোসের তুমি আমাদের গোনা পিছনের এবং সামনের মাফ করে দিও আল্লাহ আমাদের দোয়া পিছনের এবং সামনের কবুল করো আল্লাহ কোনো কিছু ক্ষতিকর হলে তার বদলা তুমি আখেরাতে দিও আল্লাহ কোনো দোয়া যদি ক্ষতিকর হয় তার বদলা আখেরাতে দিও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ আমাদেরকে তুমি কবুল করো আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তোমার 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 নৈকট্য পাওয়ার তোমার নৈকট্য দান করো আল্লাহ তোমার এলেম দান করো আল্লাহ মৃত্যু পর্যন্ত এলেম এলেম যাতে এলেমের সাথে যাতে জুড়ে থাকতে পারি আল্লাহ যাতে তোমাকে চিনতে পারি তোমার হুকুম জানতে পারি তোমার হাবিবকে চিনতে পারি তোমার হাবিবের সুন্ন জানতে পারি এবং সেই মতে আমল করতে পারি সেই তফি তুমি দান করো আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তুমি সহজ করে দিলে সমস্ত কঠিন কাজ সহজ হয়ে যাবে আর তুমি যদি সহজ না করো সবচেয়ে সহজ কাজ কঠিন থেকে যাবে আল্লাহ তুমি আমাদের কবুল করো আল্লাহ আমাদের আপন করে নাও আল্লাহ তোমার প্রতি যে দায়িত্ব সেগুলো পালন করতে পারি পুরোপুরি ভাবে এবং তোমার বান্দার প্রতি দায়িত্ব পালন করতে পারি পুরোপুরি ভাবে কারো প্রতি যদি দায়িত্ব পালন করে না থাকি আল্লাহ কারো কারো হক যদি নষ্ট করে থাকি আল্লাহ তার তাদেরকে তার বদলা তুমি দিয়ে দিও তাদেরকে আল্লাহ যারা যাতে করে তারা আমাদের মাফ করে দেয় আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ আমরা কত জনের হক নষ্ট করেছি আল্লাহ কত ধরনের গোনা কামাই করেছি কত সময় হেলায় হারিয়েছি না গোনা করে না নেকি কামাই করে আল্লাহ সমস্ত কিছু মাফ করে দিয়ে আল্লাহ তুমি তার বদলে নেকি লিখে দিও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ যেই সময়টা আমরা হেলায় হারিয়েছি সেটা সেটাও আমাদের অন্যায় আল্লাহ সেটাও মাফ করে দিও সেটার বদলেও নেকি লিখে দিও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তোমাকে তোমাকে তোমার তোমার পরিচয় হলো সবচেয়ে বড় পরিচয় তোমার জ্ঞান হলো সবচেয়ে বড় জ্ঞান আল্লাহ তোমাকে জানা হলো সবচেয়ে বড় জানা তোমাকে মানা হলো সবচেয়ে 
আসল মানা আল্লাহ তোমাকে যাতে তোমার সন্তুষ্টির জন্য মানতে পারি আল্লাহ তোমার রেজা মন্দি দান করো আল্লাহ এখলাস দান করো আল্লাহ হুসনে আখলাক দান করো আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ সমস্ত কিছু তোমার রেজা মন্দির জন্য যাতে করতে পারি আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তোমার বান্দার কাছে তোমার বান্দার কাছে তোমার বাণী যাতে পৌঁছে দিতে পারি সেই তৌফিক দান করো ও আল্লাহ তোমার ভালোবাসা আমাদের অন্তরে দান করো তোমার হাবিবের ভালোবাসা আমাদের অন্তরে দান করো আল্লাহ সমস্ত সুন্দর গুণাবলি আমাদের আমাদেরকে দান করো আল্লাহ আমরা বিভিন্ন নেক হাজতে হাত উঠিয়েছি আল্লাহ নেক চাওয়া পাওয়া নিয়ে হাত উঠিয়েছি তুমি অন্তর্জামী তুমি জানো আল্লাহ সমস্ত কিছু কবুল করো আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ সমস্ত কিছু কবুল করো আল্লাহ আমাদের জীবন সুন্দর করে দাও আল্লাহ হ্যাঁ করো আল্লাহ আমরা বিভিন্ন বিপদ আপদে হাত উঠিয়েছি আল্লাহ সমস্ত কিছু তুমি নিমেষের মধ্যে দূর করে দেখতে পারো আল্লাহ তুমি দূর করে দাও আল্লাহ আমরা বিভিন্ন অসুখ বিসুখের কারণে হাত উঠিয়েছি আল্লাহ সমস্ত অসুখ বিসুখ থেকে আমাদের পরিত্রাণ দাও আমাদের আত্মীয় স্বজনকে পরিত্রাণ দাও আমাদের সন্তান সন্ততিকে পরিত্রাণ দাও আমাদের বন্ধু বান্ধব যারা অসুস্থ তাদের পরিত্রাণ দাও আল্লাহ আমাদের আমাদের পাড়া প্রতিবেশী যারা অসুস্থ তাদের পরিত্রাণ দাও আল্লাহ আমাদের দেশবাসীকে পরিত্রাণ দাও আল্লাহ আমাদের বিশ্ববাসীকে পরিত্রাণ দাও আল্লাহ সমস্ত মুসলমানকে মাফ করো আল্লাহ সমস্ত মানুষকে হেদায়ত দান করো আল্লাহ মাগফিরাত করো হেফাজত করো আল্লাহ রহমত করো আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তোমার শান মতো তোমার শান মতো চাইতে পারলাম না আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তোমার শান কি সেটাও জানতে পারলাম না আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ তোমার শান মতো চাইতেও পারলাম না আল্লাহ তোমার শান মতো হেফাজত চাইতে পারলাম না আল্লাহ রসুল্লাহ সাল্লাহ ইসলাম যার থেকে পানা চেয়েছিলেন যা যার থেকে পানা চেয়েছিলেন আমরা তার থেকে পানা চাই আল্লাহ রসুল্লাহ সাল্লাহ ইসলাম যা কিছু চেয়েছিলেন আমরা তাই চাই আল্লাহ মুসকিলাতি <laughs> আসসালামু আলাইকুম ওয়া রাহমাতুল্লাহি ওয়া বারাকাতুহু এখন মনে হয় আনমিউট করা যাবে প্লিজ ট্রাই ইনশাআল্লাহ আমরা সামনের বার মিলিত হব সবাই সবাইকে দাওয়াত দিই যাতে আল্লাহ তাআলা তৌফিক দেন এবং সবাই সবার জন্য দোয়া করি যাতে ফেরেশতাদের দোয়া পাই আমরা